Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Hope First Baptist Church this morning, this beautiful Sunday morning that we, that we take the opportunity each year to uh, celebrate our mothers or, or the women in our lives who have raised us, who have taught us, who have nurtured us, encouraged us, corrected us, and uh, just made us the people that uh, we are today. Thank you to all the women in our lives that, that have done that. Thank you for coming and worshiping with us. Thank you for joining us online. I uh, especially want to welcome any first time guests that are with us today. But thank you again as we worship our Lord and Savior. Just a reminder, um, Bible study on Tuesday night at, at 6.30. Dennis is leading us through the, the prayers of the Bible. So if you have time, write that down and, and be a part of that. Uh, we did finally make connection with uh, Westport Camp this week and, and took all your supplies that, <clears throat> excuse me, that you brought for them. Uh, they are extremely thankful for those gifts. And just a reminder that you still can order things online through Amazon and have shipped direct to them if you'd like to do that. On ladies, uh, women, on May the 18th, there is a, a dinner, a pitch-in dinner. The, uh, Turkey and noodles will be provided, but you are asked to bring uh, salads, <clears throat> a vegetable side or dessert, bring your own table, table service, and uh, bring your favorite hat. They will have a, a uh, friendly uh, contest on, on the best hat, the funniest hat, or, or the most original hat. Um, there is a flyer in, in the bulletins that, that has a little bit more about that. And I think that's it this morning. So would you join me in prayer this morning? Our dear Heavenly Father, what, what a beautiful day it is to, to come together and, and worship you as, as this family, dear Lord. We thank you, dear Lord, for our mothers. We thank you that, that you put into their hearts the, the need that, that their children would need love. We thank you, dear Lord, for, for the other women in our lives that that um, have raised us, took over, dear Lord, when, when our own mothers are not available to do that. We thank you for the foster mothers. We thank you for those mothers that, that have taken children in and adopted them. Uh, we ask a special blessing upon them, dear Lord. We thank you for the aunts and the grandmothers and, and the neighbors. Uh, all of those that have had a part in, in raising us and bringing us up, dear Lord. We thank you especially for those that have taught us uh, your ways, that have brought us to church and read us the Bible, taught us the way that, that we should go. We ask this morning, dear Lord, a special blessing upon those mothers that have lost loved ones, that have lost children, dear Lord. What a heartbreak that must feel, and we just ask your special comfort upon them, especially on this day. Dear Lord, we thank you again for our pastor and for the way he leads us into your word that not only makes it understandable, but, but is easy to listen to, dear Lord. We thank you for the message that you give him each and every day. We thank you for, for all of those in, in the church that, that work together to, to teach our children, to teach the adults, to, to make uh, the church work as you would have it to work. We ask your blessing upon each of us as we go out into the community to our own jobs and to our own um, hobbies that, that we may be a light, a beacon into you wherever we go. We pray, dear Lord, that as we gathered here today, that the message that you have for us may enter into our lives, that we may carry it with us. 
We pray for those individuals this morning that uh, need your hand of care. Those who have lost loved ones, those that are facing surgery, dear Lord, we pray for, for healing touch upon those that, that need your hand of healing, whether it be physical or emotional or spiritual, dear Lord. We just, just pray that, that you would lend your hand to them. Now as we continue with, with our worship, joining the worship that goes on eternally in heaven, may you be pleased, may you be glorified. All this we pray in your son's precious name. Amen. I found this, a copy of this, in uh, my own mother's Bible. There's a dear and precious book, though it's worn and faded now, which recalls the happy days of long ago when I stood at mother's knee with her hand upon my brow and heard her voice in gentle tones and low. As she read those stories or of those mighty men of old, of Joseph and Daniel and their trials, of little David bold, who became a king at last, of Satan with his mighty wicked wiles. Then she read of Jesus' love, as he blessed the children dear, how he suffered, bled, and died upon the tree of his heavy load of care. Then she dried my flowing tears with her kisses, as she said it was for me. Well, those days are past and gone, but their memory lingers still, as the dear old book each day has been my guide. And I seek to do his will, as my mother taught me then, and ever in my heart his word abide. Blessed book, precious book, on thy dear old tear-stained leaves I love to look. Thou art sweet day by day, as I walk the narrow way that leads at last to that bright home above. Amen. Will you stand with us this morning as we raise our hearts and voices in song?
the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord.
be seated. Thanks, buddy. Amen. You want to give a worship team a hand? Good to have our peeps back. Good deal. All right. We've got a mic. We don't have one. Angie, could you just give us three minutes of what you were uh voted in to do and what you're going to be doing. You mind just stand and let us know? All right. Good morning. I am Angie Crowder. I was just elected as a GOP uh, state delegate. And in June, I will be going up to Indianapolis for a couple of days. And I will be voting for the Republican nomination for Secretary of State state treasurer and state auditor. Um, also, they will be voting on um, the Republican platform. There could be some things that come up. Um, and that was a big part of why I wanted to run. Um, very important to keep our Christian values in place. And, and um, that to me was the most important part of all um, because I have a strong moral core. <laughs> And I love my Lord, and I want to keep that. Um, when we took God out of schools, that changed a lot of things. And um, hopefully one day we can get all that put back. Um, that's my hope and prayer. And it's been an interesting, I've never been in the political realm at all. And so this is a new, new thing for me, and it's been eye-opening, challenging at times. So I would ask you to please pray for me. Um, it is, it's not been an easy task and I have done my due diligence in, um, meeting with the majority of the candidates that I will be voting for. There's only like one or maybe two that I have not met. Um, so I'm really looking forward to representing, um, our town and our state. And, um, like I said, please be praying for me for all of that. Thank you. Put that right there. Good. So there's a plan, uh, a plan B that is actually the plan A. Uh, a, uh, a nurse and mom that's now doing other stuff. <laughs> Thank God for Angie. Let her do it so I don't have to. That's a good day. No, let's pray for it real quick, okay? Quickly. Lord, we thank you for, Angie, we thank you for uh, uh, a nudging that you gave her and an anointing that followed it. We thank you that uh, she's done uh, work. And I pray your anointing on it. I pray as she steps into this phase that, you're, uh, that you would lead her and that you would empower her to accomplish all that you've designed. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, bless the person next to you just so they know they've been blessed. 
Now the other, now that that was the warm up. Now the next one, you can really mean it and go bless you. I'm, I mean it this time. The last time I just did it because he told me to. This time I'm serious. Good. Yeah. Um, I have a theme in the back of my head of uh, this, an idea of prayer that invades the impossible. And uh, last couple, three weeks, I'm touching along that lines. Uh, we're doing a, a, a class about prayer on Tuesday night. I invite you to come out at 630. Um, and this morning, I want to talk about prayer, that there are impossible circumstances. And what the Lord does is he prompts, especially when he's going to do something, he prompts people to begin to pray. And then he gives answer to the prayers that we request. And so uh, anybody in here ever had an impossible situation where human beings really couldn't help you that much and you needed the hand of the Lord? And so uh, I, I, and I, I want to touch the idea of uh, it being Mother's Day and bless the mom, bless the mom next to you. If there's one around, just bless you. If you're here and your mom's here, you already blessed her because she wanted you to be here. Now, uh, and now you're here. OK, and I want I want to add that theme to it. But I'm going to I'm going to be talking about mom's prayers. And if you wanted a, a title, it is there's a prelude to a breakthrough. Before a breakthrough comes, before things change, so there is a prelude to that. The prelude is most of the times prayer. And always when you see God moving, you will find that somewhere somebody was praying before that thing happened, generally. OK, uh, and so a prelude to a breakthrough is prayer. And I want to call it mom's prayers today and look at it because that is true in the Bible where there will be a breakthrough. But what you'll find is there was a mama in a prayer meeting before the breakthrough happened. OK, and so I want to, I'm going to look at the power of mother's prayers, but let's see it as prayer is a prelude to breakthrough. There are things that are difficult, impossible, challenging. We're going to see one of those today. Uh, and a mom comes and prays for a child. The child, when we look at this uh, story, I want you to, to see this when we come to the end of it. The child never had faith, but the mom did. Okay. The child was in bondage. The mother was not. The mother that is outside the bondage prays for the child that is in bondage. The child never talks to Jesus, yet goes free. Okay, right there's an amen. I'll, I'll just buy that one, whatever that one costs right there. The child never talks to Jesus, but goes free. Because the mom talks to Jesus for the child. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to I want to look at that. There are several places in Scripture we could go. We could talk about that, about children being touched by God because the mom prays for the child. And I don't know what all the theology of it is. I know that it's in the Bible that a child can be far from God, walking away from God, not doing anything anything toward coming toward God, a mom will pray and there will be an invasion of God in the child. The child will turn around because the mom has prayed for the child. And uh, me, I am an example of that. So uh, that it, it means something to me that there is power in a mother's prayer to break bondage that is over a child. And here's a key that I can encourage a couple moms with, even when the child is not trying to find God. But the mom talks to Jesus on their behalf and there is a change that happens. So it, it, it is my opinion, and I'm usually right. Uh, <laughs> obviously, does somebody say obviously? Of course. Uh, uh, no. It is my opinion, one of the greatest forces, and, and I'll, I'll give you maybe a historical context. I'm going to make a pretty provocative statement. One of the greatest forces in the history of the world is mother's prayers. Where a mother will pray for one of their children or a, a group of their children, and you will see children that have great success in the natural and spiritual realm 
And nobody knows who the mom was, but you can trail it back and read mom's diaries or people will know this was the mom that prayed and you'll see great success in the children. But in the spirit realm, you could follow that success back and say it wasn't their education, though their education was helpful. It wasn't uh, their gifts and talents, though their gifts and talents. But if you have some gifts and talents, half of them came from mom anyway. Uh, It wasn't their gifts and talents, though those were good. It was that there was a mother that was praying and the mother's prayers are heard in heaven and God hears those prayers and acts in the earth. And so uh, God has chosen that prayer is the method that he will use to govern history. That's a very provocative statement. God's method for governing history is prayer. And at the top of the list of those who pray our moms. Because when a baby, and it's a Hebrew word, when a baby was in the womb, it was a part of mom, and mom was a part of it. When it leaves the womb, that internal connection does not change, though the physical connection changes. So there's a word in the Bible called compassion. Anybody ever read compassion in the Bible? It means that you love, but the root of that word is the feeling that a mom has for a child that's growing in her belly. That's the word compassion. She's never met it yet, but when she does meet it, she won't love it more. Because the affection for that child as it grows inside is still there when the baby exits the womb, goes into the earth. And if they're two or if they're 22, it doesn't make difference in her heart. Therefore, that emotion drives prayer in a different way than any other praying. Because of that, mother's prayers are unique in the spiritual dynamic because of the emotion that they feel that is unique to the child. Okay? Uh, There was a lady by the name of Susanna Wesley. Anybody ever heard of Susanna Wesley? Maybe one or two people have heard of Susanna Wesley. Susanna Wesley changed the world from the day she was alive until today. And she was only a housewife, only in capital letters with two quotations. Because Susanna Wesley in the early 1700s had a uh, tradition and a thing that she did in her home that all the children understood and they reacted to. The 1700s, what was a woman's work like? There wasn't a microwave, so what was cooking like? Oh, wait a minute. All day, every day, there wasn't electricity. So guess what? Fire. And who gathers the wood to build the fire? Uh, How many washing machines in 1705? How many washing machines were there in the home? One. It was called mom, right? And uh, there was a there was a wash tub and there was a wash board. Anybody ever wash clothes on a wash tub or a wash board? I've done that. It is not fun. And you have to, and then you have to wring them out because the spinner don't spin them. And here's the spinner, right? And then you hang them on, uh, a friend of mine put it on the other day, what was it? Uh, It was a solar hydro dryer. (laughs) It's a clothesline. Yeah, wind and sun dry the clothes, right? Uh, Susanna Wesley in the 1700s had a tradition that her children knew. If her apron was over her head, she was praying and she was not to be interrupted no matter what. That's called going to the bathroom for women in this generation. Your kids will not leave you alone. You go to the bathroom. Uh, I don't know. Maybe she was doing some real praying under there. I think she just wanted a break. And uh, no kids are allowed to bother me. Okay. In her home were two sons. One's name was John. One's name was Charles. 
Those two men grew up. John Wesley became one of the major voices in the first great awakening that changed the course of young America that set it on course to be a Christian nation. Oh, by the way, he started something called the Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. The Methodist Church split, and that's where Pentecostals and Charismatics came from. Eighty percent of Christians on the earth, on the whole earth, have been influenced by the Charismatic or Pentecostal movement. And you cannot number the hospitals and schools that have been uh, affected by the Methodist Church. And Susanna Wesley was simply a housewife, mom, wife that knew how to put an apron over her head, talk to God, and change the world for generations to come. Ooh. So mom's prayers, and we could look at, I could take you through important men in history that have shaped world history, that behind them was a mom that prayed for them. And in many cases, when they were young, their mom already had prophetic insight into who they would become and would raise them into who the mom uh, had known from God. This is who my child is supposed to come. Everybody needs a mom that understands that you are the best one in the world, no matter what anybody else thinks. I remember in uh, junior high school, my mom going to football games. She doesn't understand football, doesn't know a thing about football, never knew the rules. She just knew when 42 had the ball in his hand, you scream real loud. <laughs> And uh, one time I'd made an interception. I'm coming down the sideline, and another guy, he's, he's, he's got the angle on me, hit me and picked me up. When he picked me up, I'm looking into the stands. I saw my mother jump up, and she said, you put my son down. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> <laughs> My stats really weren't that good, but in her eyes, that number 42 was the best football player on the field. And there's something about a mom's ability to transfer that emotion and that viewpoint to God in prayer that says there is never a child that is too far gone, that God's hand can't touch, and mom's prayers can't change. And so God uses that and has influenced this planet by the power of mother's prayers. Give you five points. Number one, and I'm going to illustrate one of them in Scripture, and then I'm going to go to the Bible, uh, and we're going to look at a little passage. Number one, mother's prayers influence the power of God. That's pretty self-explanatory. Power is not being released. Circumstances are very dark, dim. They're difficult. They're, it, 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 it looks impossible. A mom prays. God's power is released, and what was impossible becomes possible on the other side. So God, mom's prayers influence the power of God. And uh, I want to talk about this one because it's going to come up when we look at it in just a minute. Mom's influence, mom's prayers influence the timing of God. And, and, and I could give you two illustrations of Scripture. I could give you maybe one more, uh, possibly two more. Okay, but I'm going to give you two that you all know. God has a timetable. Things happen in timing. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm going to show you two instances in the Scripture where something is supposed to happen in this time, and a mom prays, and what's supposed to happen down the road happens before it's time for it to happen because a mom prayed. How about if God said, this is going to happen, it's going to happen in about six, eight years. And there was a mom that said, my kid's in trouble. I don't have six, eight years to wait. I'm asking you to do it now. And God goes, okay. We're about to see that in the Bible. But let me remind you of one you might remember. Uh, 
Mary's cousin, most likely, somebody she knew, family, was having a wedding. And uh, some of the uh, people got a little excited and drank all the wine. You remember that story in the Bible? And uh, they're out, <laughs> and they've still got a week of wedding left to go, right? The ceremony hadn't even happened yet, and all the wine's gone. How are we going to, how we, how we going to celebrate? Does anybody remember uh, what happened? You, you might not remember exactly if you haven't read in a minute. They went to Mary and said, we're out. <laughs> and what did Mary do? Went to Jesus and said, son, now watch this. This used to be everybody else's problem. Now it's my problem, and I'm going to make my problem your problem. Right? Now watch, let's remember what Jesus said. What do I have to do with this? With you, actually. Because here's what he said. It is not yet my time. The time meaning, it's not yet time for me to reveal who I am and bring supernatural power to the natural realm and demonstrate my kingdom. That's what he said. She said, would you please help this situation? Guys, Walmart wasn't there. They couldn't drive down the street and get some. Okay? Would you please touch the impossible? He goes, it's not my time. This is very mom-like. She just turned to the other people and said, do whatever he says. It'll be all right. <laughs> and Jesus turned water into wine when it was not time because his mom asked him to. Yeah. So when you're praying for the impossible, mama, and you go, I don't know, it might not be God's timing. You just go, okay, but I'm a mom. <laughs> and I'm asking you, would you just break your own time frame in relationship to my prayer? I'm going to show you that in the Bible. Again, in a minute. So what are mom's prayers influence? The power of God. Number two, they influence the timing of God. And number three, this was probably the most important one. Mom's prayers touch, influence the compassion of God. God has a mama's heart. That's where mama's got it from. The Bible says that he will be near to the brokenhearted. What it says is, I heard your cry, I saw your tears, I remember them, it's in the book of 1 Kings, and I respond to the cry of your heart and the tears that are coming down your face. Here's what God says, I know what that is feels like. That's what the word compassion means. And we'll see it when we look at the uh, passage just a second, is that a child's trouble becomes the mother's pain. When a child is going through it, the mother's going through it. You will never hurt a mother worse than if you touch her child. And you will never bless a mother more than if you bless her child. And so when a mom prays, there is a compassion that connects with the heart of God. And God moves in response to that compassion. Now, if you're not a mom, just go say, just say for a minute, let me translate that. Okay, there's an impossible situation. Compassion will rise 
and out of prayer to compassion will be released and God will touch impossible situations because compassion has touched compassion in his heart. Okay? Then number next is a mom's prayers touch the activity of God. God moves in response to prayer. Okay? Somebody make up a poem. Oh, Ron read one. We've had a poem. Now we've had points. We're going to write a, read a Bible school, uh, Bible, the Bible, and that will be an official church meeting. We sang. We had poem, points, and Bible scripture. All right. We are good Baptists, right? I think we marked all the boxes if we do that. Now, I want, to take a, I want to take a scripture, and I want you to see some things. And as we go through this scripture, I want you to trail a, a word. The word is answer. I had a buddy one time said, our problem is we don't pray enough. Our problem is we don't get enough answers. He goes, I don't mind the praying part. I want some answers on the other end. So we're going to look at Jesus. We're going to look at this interaction between a woman and Jesus. And I want you to look at our, our, our trail. It's not really points. We're just going to trail through this scripture. And our trail will be the word answer. Okay, and I'll, I'll, I'll cause us to see a few things around each time this word answer is there. All right, let's look. Behold, a woman of Canaan came from the region and cried out to him, Jesus, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. So she has a daughter that's in a bondage. There's a demon that will take over the daughter. And the daughter, uh, in some cases in Scripture, you'll see uh, uh, self-afflict. They cut themselves. Or uh, what's it called? Self-harm behavior. Or they want to run away into darkness. Or they want to self-seclude. One guy broke chains. Or uh, uh, another child would throw himself into the fire, throw himself into the water, right? Either trying to drown or burn himself. So there's a woman who says, watch this, have mercy on who? Me by healing my daughter. Did you see that connection? The woman did not say, heal me, and she did not say, have mercy on my daughter. What does she say? Have mercy on me by healing my daughter because my daughter's trauma is my pain. Do you see that in the scripture? But he answered her not a word. Here's our first time we see answer. And I want to make three statements. I want to make ten. I'll cut it to three. Here's number one. Silence. Whenever God is silent, silence does not mean no. I'm going to say it again, and this time you amen it, just so everybody will know. Silence does not mean no. Okay? What did the woman ask for? What's her request? Daughter be healed. By the time we get to verse 28, her daughter is going to be healed. Was Jesus silent? Was he silent? Does it say he was silent? Was he silent? Did her daughter get healed? Yes. Does silence mean no? No. So whenever I pray and it feels like God is not answering, that does not mean God has said no to the request that I have made. Some people pray for things for a period of time and they go, God, there's two things people will say. God's not going to answer it. Here's another one. It must not be God's timing. And if I could do anything today, it would be to encourage you, because the answer is not here yet, don't say God's not going to answer it, and don't say it's not God's timing. It might not be God's timing. I'm saying I'm good. God's smart. Let his timing be his timing. But what I'm saying is there is a prayer that will influence the timing of God and God will do things out of time because somebody asked him to do it. Okay. But he answered her not a word. Now watch his disciples think delay means no. His disciples, watch, his disciples are irritated by her. Somebody say irritated. 
okay? Number one, she's a woman. That was irritating. No, I'm, I'm not playing. When a Pharisee walked into church, here's what he prayed. God, thank you, you made me a man, not a woman. That was his first prayer. His second prayer was, thank you, that you made me a Jew and not a Gentile. These guys are Jews, they're not Gentiles, and they are not women, and they don't like either one, and she's both. Okay? And so now, I tell you what, Jesus was the greatest women's right individual in the history of the planet. And so Jesus is standing there, and like most Christians, they made God in their own image, and they think that what they're thinking is what God's thinking. <laughs> and they go, this woman's irritating me. She won't shut up, and she's a woman, and she's a Gentile. And I'm just a tad bit agitated, and I wish she would leave. And Jesus is being silent, so he must wish that too. <laughs> Aha. I won't get too far off track, but... There is an acquiescence that is assumed when you are silent. And somebody says something that is very anti-Christian, anti-Scripture, anti-Bible, anti-your worldview, and your silence can often say, I acquiesce to the statement. It can be interpreted like that. And that's the interpretation because God hasn't spoken. Right? Well, let's see what their idea is. He answered her not a word. His disciples came. Uh, uh, yeah, let me stay on this one just for a second. Uh, and urged him saying, send her away. She's agitating me. That's what cries after us mean. I have a question. Was her prayer audible or inaudible? Audible. How could it agitate them if it was not audible? She's not think praying in her mind. She's actually praying out loud, right? And what's her prayer? You know what it is. What is it? Have mercy on me. How do you think she's praying it? Oh, oh, Lord. If you want to know how she's praying it, go to Riley. With a mom whose baby's sick, there's nothing the mom can do. Her emotion is broken. And now here is some hope because I heard you heard you have healed other kids' children or, or, or other people's children. How's she praying? Have mercy on me. Enough to agitate some disciples. So they say your silence must mean you're not going to answer it. Let's look. But he answered her not a word. His disciple urges send her away. Verse 24. And now, what's our key word we're looking at? He answered her. Now, he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You see what he's saying? I am the God. I am the Savior of the Jews. What is she? What are his disciples doing right now? What do you think? Are you think they're amening, or do you think they're going, no, that's not right? Which one do you think they're doing? Amen. They got to amen. Yeah. No, I was not sent. They think there's been a political line drawn, and Jesus is on their side. Because he said, I am sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Let me give you a history lesson. We'll come back. This is, this is at, uh, Matthew chapter what? 15, in Matthew 28, what does Jesus say? Go ye therefore into all the world. Do you know they never did that, Acts chapter 2? They never did that for about six years. By Acts chapter 2, they're still in Jerusalem. Did they go into all the world? No. So here's what's, here's what's happening. I really want you to see this because it is an extremely important point. Jesus goes, you're, a, you're not a Jew. Six or eight years, we'll get around to coming to you. Maybe your daughter will be alive then. <coughs> Excuse me. Six, eight more years of darkness in the timing of God. <laughs> and she goes, my baby's sick now. <laughs> Have mercy on me. Heal my daughter. And Jesus is not looking at her. He's just speaking. And what he is doing is speaking to her, but he's speaking to his disciples. Because what did they call Gentiles? 
Does anybody know? Jews called Gentiles dogs. Say it. Did you, who said it? They called them dogs. Jesus is about to get real serious at a time frame in between. It is dark, bondage, difficult. There's a mom who wants to see her baby go free. Jesus is about to set everybody up. Right? Look what he says. Then she came, watch, he answered them, I'm, I'm from the last, uh, I, I just came to heal the Jews. Watch, she, she just amps it up, check it out. And she came, fell down at his feet and starts worshiping him. She goes, dude, I don't care about theology, help me. <laughs> Timing of God's amazing, but help me, right? Let's look at what he says, but he, what, what's our word? He's answered her, now he's answered them, watch this. But he answered and said, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to what? Little dogs. What do the Jews call Gentiles? Little dogs. Look what Jesus is saying. It's not good to take the children's bread. Healing, deliverance is what that is. And it is him. He is the bread of life. It is not good to take. I'm from the lost house of the child of Israel. It's not good to take the children's bread and give it to little dogs. Hmm. I'll make some statements in a minute to help to clear this up. Look at this. And she goes, oh, by the way, little dogs do eat the same bread kids eat. Because when the kids are at the table, they take the bread and put it under the table and give it to the dog. My son, Josh. <laughs> Some reason the dogs are coming around the table. And the reason they're coming around the table, B, A, is he might be concerned from the dogs, but B, he don't want to eat what's on his plate. <laughs> and so somehow the food that was meant for the children becomes the food that the dogs eat. The only difference, come on, watch, is time. We eat it at the table. After it's over, we scrape it into a plate. We take it, and the dogs are actually eating the children's bread. They're just eating it an hour later. Hmm. Look what Jesus says. It is not good to take children's bread, throw it to the dogs. And she goes, but the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, Mama. <laughs> <laughs> Woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. Let's recreate this. She is in hope. Her daughter is in Columbus. Her daughter is manifesting self-destructive behavior. People are maybe monitoring that little baby. Maybe she's having a seizure. I don't know what's going on, little child. Maybe she's having a seizure. I don't know what the manifestation was. But mama is talking to Jesus at 12 o'clock in hope. The baby has been manifesting from the time mama left Columbus to get and fight through the crowd and all that, maybe all night long. At 12 o'clock, Jesus looks to the mom and goes, your faith is amazing. What do you want? Let your daughter be healed. And in Columbus at 12 o'clock, when Jesus answers the mom's prayer, the child's life changes. When they get back together, I think they had sundial watches like on the Flintstones. When they get back together, the mom says, Jesus gave me a breakthrough at 12 o'clock. And the caretaker says, the, the breakthrough came at exactly 12 o'clock. See, there is a point of breakthrough. 
There is a time where it was in bondage, no longer in bondage. Was sick, no longer sick. Was in darkness, now in light. There is a point where everything changes. And what has happened is this woman is contending for that point. When that point comes for the child that has never come into contact with Jesus, the breakthrough comes because the mother was in contact with Jesus. And so now the encouragement comes I am not simply responding to help the broken because they're broken. I am responding to the well to help the broken because the well has come to Christ. Isn't that interesting? Let me make a couple points. Or not. Yeah, two points. Point number one. In between the prayers beginning and the breakthrough coming, this lady's going to show us two things. I got five. I'm going to give you two. Okay. Here's, here's two things. Number one, she is more focused on who Jesus is than who she isn't. If you're a mom in the room... Culture, the enemy, and your own mind will always remind you of who you are not. Most moms, whenever a child has a problem, the first thing that comes to their inner being is what the resistance says is you haven't done enough. He didn't do it right. He should have done this differently. A, B, C, D, and there's a hundred things that will hit the mom. Some of it's general and some of it is handcrafted for you. In the midst of the prayer until the breakthrough, is any mom, would any mom say he's telling you the truth? <laughs> In between, she is focused on who he is instead of who she isn't. Who he is drives the conversation. Well, you're just a little dog. That's what she had always heard from Jews. But who you are is more important than who I am not. And oh, by the way, isn't that such wisdom? Dogs and kids do eat the same food. It just comes later. I'm asking you for later now. And he goes, okay. Point number two. She is focused on what Jesus can do more than what she cannot do. Whenever a circumstance is impossible, I'm overwhelmed with my inability. The prayer that will be a prelude to breakthrough is the prayer that focuses on his ability more than my inability. All that will build up and will change in a moment of time. In that moment of time is what the mom is looking for when she is praying for her child. I want it to go from darkness to light from brokenness to wholeness, from sickness to health, there's a time that that will change. I am contending for that point. The way I contend for that point is I see who he is, not who I am not. I focus on what he's able to do, not what I am not able to do. I will pray and I will worship on behalf of the one that I am praying for until that breakthrough comes. There may be voices that want to push me away, but the drive in my heart is more intense than the voices on the outside. And so she sets her mind, I will continue to touch Jesus until he touches my child. 
Let's pray for a moment. Just invite the Holy Spirit to just move among us. And I want you to take your impossible and just hand it to the Lord. Lord, I don't understand it. This is difficult. I can't figure it out and I can't fix it. Here's an impossible. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would just invade right now. I pray that you would bring encouragement where there's been discouragement. I pray you would bring hope where there's been hopelessness. I pray that you would bring endurance where there's been a wearing down and tiredness. But I pray that you would bring a strength where there's been weakness. Father, I pray over my friends gathered in this room that today be a turning point, a transition where things go from down to up. A breakthrough. May the God Jehovah Perizim, the God of the breakthrough, break through on behalf of those that I pray for right now. And I pray that you would elevate and lift them up. Lord, I pray for children that are wayward away from the presence of the Lord, away from your ways, that are walking in a direct direction opposite of you. And uh, Lord, there are mother's prayers for mothers in this room, for their own children. I pray that you would honor those prayers. I pray that you would hear them. I pray that you would touch those children, some in this room, some other places, that you would touch them where they are because a mom has touched you where you are. I pray that a grace that is greater than any setback, trip up, fall, I pray that grace would interact and impact hearts. Lord, over the last few weeks, we've just had testimony after testimony of impossible situations being broken and challenged and changed. And I pray that that would happen this morning. In the moment when we come to worship and when we open up an altar, there may be uh, someone here that has particular breakthrough that they need. I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would release grace over that. I pray for moms in the room. I pray that you would lift off discouragement and impart encouragement. Lord, I pray where uh, difficulty has been that you would, you, you would bring victory and success. I pray that uh, moms that are in this room that are tired, that your grace would just infuse them with internal strength. I pray lying voices against their character would be silenced. Father, on this, uh, on this Mother's Day, some of us in the room without moms today, I pray that you would be the encouragement. Lord, I pray for mothers and grandmothers that have prayed, prayers that are yet to be answered, but uh, in this generation they will be answered because they prayed them in their generation. May the encouragement and life and power of that bring life in this room today. Pray your blessing on those gathered here. And may your grace encounter our understanding our abilities, and our living. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Our worship team.